communicate is not just a back and forth process. It's sometimes in some children with developmental disabilities, there's a lot of internal communication going on. Autistic spectrum disorder, <laughs> excuse me, they're doing a lot of ruminating. They might get a thought going, particularly if they get it all anxious and they are internally driven for communication as well. Interestingly, Asperger's uh, people, um, I don't know if you've had that in your program, but um, they will be very verbose often. They give me a lot of, of information out, but you can't get, they, they can't get it back. So you think that they're, they're verbal because they give you, they say so much, but they're not taking a lot back. So communication has to be a back and forth connected um, process inside and outside. And then we think about um, selective hearing versus listening. Children can hear us, but how many of them are very selective in what they hear? There are, very, uh, there are developmental disabilities where the value of the hum of the gondola is gonna have as much power as the value of your voice, okay? So the selective listening is off. They're not wired quite right. Many people think about um, the end of a football game where you can shout 16 times, dinner's ready. If it's the last play of the football game, nobody's going to hear you. It's where your brain goes um, to pay attention. We don't, we don't selectively say to ourselves, oh, gee, I think I'll listen to the baby in the other room now. But you ask any new mother if they heard the baby cry last night, and they did. Our brains just tune into kind of what's um, important. So in communication, many developmental disabilities, Down syndrome, attention deficit, autism, Williams, have differences in how they are able to take in communication as well as put out communication. And the first issue with behaviorism is, are they understood? And are they understanding you? We might think they do, but communication is always a really big piece with um, the developmentally disabled population. So we have to get a sense of their ability. You're not gonna become experts overnight. It would be great if you could have continuity with children so that similar um, instructors could be with similar children so that you know how they communicate over time. You could do some quick attempts at communication with the child while they're getting dressed, while they're getting ready, get a vibe for how they're able to interact with you. In that situation, you wanna to go to something of interest to them. Don't talk about the ski boots and their jacket and what we're going to do today. Talk about their area of interest. And maybe you could get that kind of information from a parent. Like, oh, I heard you really like. That will give you a better sense. If they're feeling at all anxious about getting on skis and you start saying, oh, we're going to have a great day today. I'm going to get you to the, the bunny hill. That might not be the best way to pull communication. But you need to get like a little baseline on what their capabilities are. Um, their processing time. Sometimes with children, you'll say something and get something back. ADHD kids are classic for this. You'll say something at eight o'clock. They're going to tell you at noon. Well, you said to me at eight o'clock, you know, and um, so how they're processing and bringing things back to you. Um, gestures and facial expression. This is fascinating to me because a lot of work has been done with autism and visual regard and expressions and reading faces. And we found that infants... Um, we're not reading faces. So we started being able to diagnose autism as young as 10 to 11 months because of some of our studies on facial regard. I've been fascinated by the use of masks. I go in to see babies now looking like an astronaut. I had this on, I got this on, I got this on, I got this on. The babies know when I'm smiling at them. The tone of my voice, the way I touch them, and must just be the squints of my eyes that they see among everything else I'm wearing. Babies are smiling back at me as young as 18 to 20 weeks. I don't know how they're doing it. So the reading of the face and of the tone and is so innately wired in us. Communication is just fascinating. My grandson knows when I'm teasing him when I have a mask on. It it's absolutely fascinates me. So anyway, that's communication and are they understood? Not only did they understand what we had to say to them, but are we understanding what they have to say to us? Skiing is a huge modality to support communication because there's a freedom to it. There's a movement to it. Your communication can be physical. So you don't have to use a lot of words here. 
So a fantastic modality for working on communication with developmentally disabled, I think is right in your program. Um, okay, so secondary to communication, well, there's a lot of things, but intellectual ability. I think I had a poll question for this and this really isn't fair. So shout out what you think for this poll number two, Pat. All right, that poll is going. Intellectual ability is A, static, B, based on achievement, or C, variable. And it's an open question designed to create thought. All right, we have most answers in. What you got? Sharing the results. Ooh, variable. Okay, the reason this isn't fair is because of vernacular. Intellectual ability or disability is actually defined as what you're physically capable of neurologically. It's, it's uh, based at, by second grade, it's standardized. So essentially the file cabinet for storage that you have, the capability that you have to learn is standardized by second grade. That's your IQ, okay? It isn't static in that it doesn't have any flex. It's not that it doesn't have flexibility, but it technically, once you've established an, um, an intellectual disability, you have it for life. That's why it's considered permanent disability. Used to be called mental retardation. We don't call it that anymore. Intellectual dis So everybody's born with a certain degree of file cabinet. You have a certain volume that you can take in. Now, how you retrieve those files, what goes in those files, that is achievement, okay? Achievement is what you learn in school and do you progress? So achievement changes, absolutely. We all know people who are brilliant who can't find their way out of a paper bag. So it doesn't have to do with performance, but intellectual ability is a true innate concept of ability. When a child has altered intellectual ability, you're dealing with a different set of skills. Some children with um, autism have totally fine IQs totally fine IQs. Some can have advanced IQs. Their process of learning and their pathway of learning is different. Children with Down syndrome, most of them, if they're not mosaic down, they're full down, most of them have intellectual disability. What does intellectual disability do to behaviors? They don't learn the same way by the same pathway. Retention is a problem. It's living groundhogs day. I've had some children we've had to teach the same information to over and over again. And that's because retention isn't there. The file cabinet just isn't that big. Now there are other children that have a huge file cabinet but they can't get in there and retrieve that file. Attention deficit disorders, executive function disorders. That's more what we're talking about there. But when we look at behaviors, we have to actually look at what we're dealing with. And um, retention is a problem. We might have to repeat things over and over to get them in the same place. Um, it was fascinating to me. I, I followed a child uh, with autism at the age of two and she's now 26 and she's now my primary patient in adult medicine. And she said to me recently, um, a phrase I had used with her and now I'm forgetting what the phrase was, but she came back with a phrase I had used with her way back. I mean, we're talking early elementary school years. And I think I must have said it to her 7 billion times. That's why I don't know why I'm blocking it right now. But it was the retention that we had to get and she's got it now. So that's good news. So anyway, um, so learning, we have to be re repetitive. In skiing, the benefit to this is skiing by nature is repetitive. We pretty much do the same thing over and over again. Um, so um, that can help us. But in terms of the behaviors associated, there's also unintentional learning. And for children who have intellectual disabilities, boy, did they grab onto unintentional learning. They like have a sixth sense for certain people. If you wear a coat with a certain fur collar, they will know that you're the one who has that fur collar. Um, they will remember where the hot chocolate is when they can't find their way to the ski hill. They, there's an unintentional learning. If they skid coming off of the ski track, you know how you hit that ice or that basalt and your ski goes like this? See, again, I'm talking to experts here, so you never probably know it, but me, my skis skid and 
I, that's unintentional learning. They will learn that that's what happens when they're coming off a ski hill and they might be hesitant to get on it and you don't even know that that's the reason they don't wanna get off it. Uh, Patrick had a child once at uh, an, an adaptive program he did here in high school and she had Down syndrome and she was, Patrick had taught her to go down the hill, ski, she's racing. Well, she had learned that she shakes hands and greets her people. So we're halfway down the ski hill and she pulls over to us in the middle of the race to shake our hands and say hi. In unintentional learning. I'm social. These are my people. She didn't care that she had to get to the finish line. Her people were there, her cheerleaders. So again, unintentional learning um, can play into our behaviors. Oh, shoot. We're already running out of time, Pat. Social abilities. They're innate and they're learned. I think I had a poll question for this, but I think I'm going to blow, blow by it because I want to make sure we have time to get into interventions here. Social ability is actually neurologically driven. It has the same kind of developmental timetable and trajectories as motor system, but as a culture, we just don't track it. We track the child sits by six months, the child walks by one, the child has 10 words by one, the child talks by two. Social development, there's actually parameters of joint attention, um, interface um, and evolution of expression and gesture. Um, so it's very innate. So when the children have a disability in this realm, they're not shy. Well, they might be shy also, but what you're seeing is social disconnection on a neurologic level. When they are not connected to you and they are in their own space and they are avoiding, really tough to get them out of that snowbank. We've got to get them socially connected. We've got to get the information with us. I always, I'm doing this because I always used to do in the classroom, where's the information? The information is here with me. Now, interestingly, some children with um, disabilities do better to not look at your face. We did a lot of work to get kids on faces. Sometimes when there's a high sensory load, which hello, skiing is totally sensory, um, they might do better to not look on your face and for you to communicate with them in other ways. You might need to hand over hand the skis. When the skis twist and go like this, you might not be able to tell that child, twist your ski around and stand up. That's the child you help stand up and then experience maybe let's sit and get up again. Falling and up again is very, uh, would be very helpful for these kids so that they learn that before they're on the hill. I don't know if you have that as part of your curriculum, but I'd put it in because falling right is very helpful. <laughs> Take it from me. <laughs> okay, then physical ability. I'm going to deflect that to Patrick. Obviously there are modifications that can be made for physical disability. Because a child walks and runs and climbs does not mean they don't have physical disability. Physical disability can be perception-based. This week, I had the opportunity to be with a, a family member who has declining Alzheimer's, and he has such motor memory that he can come down 10 stairs, bam. I tried to get him off the back deck. He could not step off the deck. And that was his ability to see perception. Now he physically can do that, but his ability to plan and see perception. So we have to recognize that physical ability may be playing into that behavior as well, because we may be misperceiving what they're capable of um, based on what they do. Low tone and high tone, that's how we hold ourselves against gravity, stiffness, cerebral palsy versus being floppy, which a lot of the developmental disabilities have. Skis are great for low tone, not so good for high tone. Low tone, it stabilizes them because the ski is flat and big. High tone is a little tougher. They might need uh, more flexion with the movement. Um, my last poll was about motor memory. Motor memory is actually a tracking that happens in the brain um, that's physiologic. It's why a champion golfer doesn't have to be told how to use their grip. They don't stop and think, twist the thumb, turn the thing. You guys don't think about how you're holding your toes in your ski boot to traject down a ski hill because it's become motor memory. What you want for these kids is to do things right enough that the tracking gets made in a correct way because that will be more fun. When you're more capable, it's more fun. Um, so that's the motor side of it. Sensory issues play into behaviors tremendously. I understand you're going to have occupational therapy involved. That is awesome. She's going to help you with that understanding. Skiing is just inherently riddled with sensory information. 
I don't think that a three inch stiletto matches a ski boot for discomfort. You know, like when you think about what we expect them to wear and hold and then put the face mask on, put the helmet on, put the snow in their eyes, you're dealing with a barrage. Some kids are gonna love it, some kids are gonna hate it, but you might wanna do some desensitization around that so that they aren't, so that's not a first um, stumbling block right off uh, the mark there. Sensory input plays into emotional regulation like this. I do a workshop on this that um, when you play like one line of a music melody and people remember it, they know where they were and what they were doing. Why are Yankee Candles so infamous? Because they take you someplace. You smell the Christmas tree and you're in the Christmas tree lot, right? You smell the pumpkin and it's Thanksgiving. The emotions are very triggered to sensory input. Emotional regulation usually develops in children between two and four. That is the child with the two-year-old tantrum learns that doesn't get me anything to the four-year-old little boy behind his mother who does what I call the suck it ups. They don't wanna cry, right? They're looking behind their mother's eye. They don't wanna cry. They don't wanna be that kid. So what happens between two and four? They develop a thermostat that says, I have some self-control. I can emotionally regulate. In developmentally disabled children, that thermostat gets really thrown off. So they can have lack of control without a good trigger. And sometimes that is really felt to be defiance when children just kind of lose it. And it's usually because they're getting sensory overloaded or that thermostat is being um, played. Emotional responses in behavior are fed by our response to them. Our emotional responses in behavior are fed by our responses to them. Think of the toddler. The toddler who screams like a crazy person because they want the second ice cream cone. If you give them the second ice cream cone, what do you think the next time is gonna happen if they want a second ice cream cone? Remember that very, very basic concept because you will see that in 14 year olds, in 22 year olds. In what are we doing to reinforce what they are doing? Planned ignoring is fantastic. Now the problem with that is you have to be supervising them and they have to be safe. So planned ignoring, I taught that at one place and it got in, you know, you can't walk away from somebody. Okay, use your common sense. But planned ignoring is you're behaving like that. I'm busy right now. Can't have power. It has power, it's communicating and it's not communicating the right way. Catch them being good. Whoa, you went right out the door. Sounds ridiculous, but if what you want is movement on skis and they give you two inches, whoa, great job. Catch them being good. They don't know what you want from them a lot of times. Um, modeling. Modeling I caution on just because a lot of children with the social deficits don't imitate and have trouble imitating. So you could model something until you know the whole program through and they might not get that. You might have to help them do it and repeat it. Some children are really great at modeling, Down syndrome, Williams syndrome, um, ADHDs, they imitate and model your autistic spectrums and your intellectual disabilities, harder time with imitation. So watch that. Okay, then just two last points and then we're gonna start doing some scenarios and we'll problem to solve together based on what we've learned. Anxiety versus fear. A lot of times parents come to me and say, my child is behaving like this because they're anxious. Here's the thing on a ski hill. They're not just anxious, they are afraid, <laughs> okay? They are gonna be afraid of the unexpected. They're going to be afraid of the unexpected. You're expecting something from them that drives a lot of skills that they don't have yet. So we have to develop those skills and give them confidence in those skills so that they don't become fear-based, okay? And then the last thing that I learned recently that I thought really shifted some of my thinking with some of my clients, motivation versus momentum. Motivation is you can do this, we got this, yeah. It's good, it's been actually studied scientifically that it's good for three weeks. It's why we can only diet for three weeks. We can only quit smoking for three weeks. 
because motivation is our power as a human being to fight something. We as human beings like path of least resistance. We like to go back to what we like. It's who we are. We're pleasure seekers. Momentum is I get on a roll of doing something that feels good and I get going. That works for everything. I'm using it for cigarette smoking and it's really showing me some good data output on it. The outcomes are fantastic. Instead of I'm gonna get over this, it's today's a good day, tomorrow's gonna be better. I've got momentum. I'm doing something that's making me move in the direction I wanna move in. And I think this applies to anybody who's trying to learn a behavior or change a behavior. If we can get the children with the motivation and the adults motivated and I'm sorry, not motivated, to have momentum, to enjoy those lessons and to enjoy what they're doing, you're gonna get on a cycle and it's gonna roll forward. So those are just some real bullet points here on speed dial. Um, if you have any real specific questions about things, I'm happy, I'll give, uh, Pat has my email and I'll give you my work email, Pat, and you're welcome to send them to me and I'm happy to feel them. So now we're gonna give some big nets. Does anybody have incidences with kids that something happened and there was a behavior and, and we'll, as a team, let's try to figure out maybe again, let's see what we attributed to their behaviors too and what these factors of communication, intellectual ability, physical ability and social connection, um, understanding those would help us respond to that behavior. Great. So we'll we'll take a, a second. If you guys have a scenario uh, and want to take a second to type it into the chat, we'll get to <clears throat> as many as we can. Uh, Sarah and I can also throw out some some common scenarios that we deal with on a regular basis, and we can work through that and kind of build a skill set or tool set um, when approaching these things. Yeah. So uh, let's see if anything comes in right away. We'll give people a minute. Um, We've all had those people sit down in a snowbank or not want to put their boots on or throw, you know, throw their skis and, and not want to use their skis. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific one. Okay, here we go. We've got Jody coming in with one. I had a nonverbal autistic child who would flop down on Sunnyside and wouldn't get up. It was his first year skiing. I think she's writing a couple things here. So, okay. Good ones. Okay. So that's a, a, a very open thing. A lot can be going on behind the scenes there. How would we go about this or what questions we, would we ask first on this person who so nonverbal autistic would flop down. Flopping down, so they've already gotten to the top so of the hill. Sunny, sunny side is a is a, a ski trail, a mellow ski trail. So they're already they've already started skiing. Uh, they're part way through. I know ski sunny ride. side, Patrick. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I like sunny side. Um, so they've already gotten skiing, and then they just stop mid mid path. Yes, and they would flop down on sunny side. Wouldn't get up. First year skiing. Okay, so what kinds of things do you think could con be contributing to this? Anybody got anything? You can type them in if you, any ideas for what could be My first thought, just thinking about, okay, so you got a nonverbal autistic child. So right there, what comes to mind, what? Communication skill is really tough, right? So he can't stop and turn to her and say, it's time for hot chocolate or, you know, where's the restaurant with the Baileys? He doesn't have that capability. He's, he's not able to understand. He's already achieved getting up the ski lift and getting partially down the hill. So I think of communication that he can't tell you what he's needing and wanting, but I think about his physical abilities. If he's already gotten partly down the hill, I'm wondering if something physically is happening that's making him want to stop, right? Because he's not afraid of it. It doesn't show me that he's afraid of it unless he's learned that around the bend something happens. You know, because there's that one bend there that gets a little hairy when the others come in. Like maybe he's learned that something's ahead and he's stopping from there. But my, my gut on it would be to question, um, has he physically had a difficulty? If he's doing that repeatedly, what I would do is stop before it starts. I would give him a breakout before. I would preset him that we're going to go down the whole hill, but we are stopping at three spots. And I do it very visually. And I would start at the top of the hill with a break. 
I would stop before he does. I would help him kind of breathe. I'd help him loosen things up. I'd get him connected, looking around, feeling good. And I would break it up into segments to see if fatigue is playing in, physical readiness, um, or, or get a better handle on what's going on around him that's making him stop right there. Anybody got any other ideas on that? Okay. Uh, fear. Someone said fear. Yeah, fear. For that one. What, what is he afraid of now? Like, did he get going too fast? Um, is there something ahead that he's been trained he's afraid of? Um, fear is a big one. And then I would desensitize the fear by going through things slowly or trying another trail. Mr. K, I'm telling you. Um, and I'm so I'm hearing kind of as a process, you're asking a lot of questions. You're being patient in what is going on. If someone, and correct me if I'm wrong, if someone does this behavior and then you react quickly, you may be missing out on the true cause or the true solution. So stopping and asking a lot of questions to yourself is there are there physical needs? Are there emotional needs? Um, do we need more structure? All of these things. And then testing them out uh, patiently. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Yes. And somebody just said tired. Yes. Yes. I've been known to flop down tired. Yes. Yeah. So really taking those that time. Uh, great one. Whole can panel. One? Sure. Um, just Barbara. It seems like also a lot of our participants need routine. So like Jody, if you've had this particular participant for a long time, and you know, every day you're like, okay, Johnny, here's what we're going to do. We have our skis on, we go into the lift line, we get to the top, we, go, we start our skis, we stop here, we stop here, we stop here. And a lot of times, especially with kids with autism, really need that routine. And if something kind of goes cattywampus along the way, then a lot of times, boom, they go down for the count because something's gone disarray somewhere along your scheduling. And then personally, what I, what I do is I reevaluate what, where are, we, go, we talk through what we initially started doing and then we backtrack. Did we put our skis on? Yep. Did we get in the lift line? Yep. Did we get up the chairlift? Yep. Did we go down the hill? Yep. Did we stop at the right place? No. Oh. And then, and then all of a sudden it kind of triggers and we, and then I start to think or whatever, okay, I need to reevaluate what went wrong. So, hey, Johnny, can we, make, can we even just move our ski tips up the hill a little bit to um, counteract what would just happen? Okay, are we back on schedule? Yes, we are. I mean, sometimes it's that easy, sometimes it's not. But this routine with a lot of our participants, I think for most of us realize routine and that uh, systematic. He just jumped in about fear, Sarah. And I think fear, if he's afraid of that, then you have to get to the place where he's not afraid of it anymore. Right. So, um, you know, uh, going, I love that go up thing where you put your skis up the hill, Pat does. <laughs> you know, different ways that they feel in control of their skis so they're not afraid. Mm -hmm. Might be uh, some technical uh, tips there. Uh, a side program note that ties into this. Um, I noticed there's, there are some new volunteers. Thank you for being here. Um, just some program information. One of the beauties of our program is we get uh, the opportunity to ski with the same people over and over again. At Big Sky, people come back year after year. And at Bridger, we have an eight-week program uh, where you can sign up and work with the same participant one day a week um, for eight weeks. So you really have the benefit of being patient and learning how someone communicates and learning their needs awesome. and, um, and can really can really benefit from this kind of, of mindset. Um, I particularly like this question about the I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, and especially for those that with kids with Down syndrome, we hear that a lot. Um, and so, I mean, I have a few tricks, but I'm interested in hearing other people's way they handle that because they're is uh, there's there there's some good tips and tricks out there to get people re-motivated to where I can and I think last night we mentioned that this is a can-do program what's your thought on that Barbara I didn't hear what the scenario was a yeah, I can't I can't I can't I can't yeah that's actually very habituated and it's very um, common with children with intellectual disability because they are constantly feeling pushed in their world 
So what you want to do is give them the scenario of maybe have doing something that's easier and then saying, look what you did. And then use that as a visual learning tool. I remember when you did this and you did it really well. You can do that. You did this. So you give them like an experiential, uh, what I call visualization to tie back to. Think about them learning to read. I can't get it. Learning their so they've really habituated into this pattern. Anytime a child does something repetitively like that, you can think of it as a habit-based thing and it's coming from their other, their big world. So think, well, how can I make skiing help this? Skiing can help this by giving them small pieces that they can do and can experience it as it can do. Even if it's just a little snow bang, you can do. I see you can do. Then you go on the little hill and they're still saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. And you say, I saw you do you can do and they have the visual memory of it uh, yeah so to tie that into to skiing what are some things you can do to give someone a, a smaller win if if maybe the terrain is too intense you can dial back the terrain maybe they're lying on the snow and they can't they can't they can't maybe they can build a snowball we're, we're changing into something they can do and and still providing them with engagement um, but more on a comfortable set of terms there are many ways we can do that on a ski hill other, and just a couple other tricks as well is that let's if, if skiing has become when they plop down again and I can't I can't redirect that to what they can do can they play basketball yeah I'm a really good basketball player we've already forgot about skiing that's great well why don't we practice shooting our baskets while we move down the hill next thing oh you know they're shooting their baskets so kind of you know if we can draw things back to what they're good at where they can and they know they can. And like, Robert, what you were saying is to reiterate that, hey, I've seen you do this. Uh, your mom told me you did this. There are all these little, this, this reaffirmation about what they can do gets that momentum, as you were speaking about, moving forward. Um, update on Jody's student, update alert. Uh, uh, we get more information. This same student who was sat down on defiantly, or not defiantly, sat down and did not want to ski anymore on Sunnyside, before that, he was completely happy on the bunny hill. So this could be this could be a fear scenario. Um, one option there is maybe you could go back to the bunny hill and keep building those skills. Um, we don't need to be committed because we just moved up once. Any thoughts on that, guys? Mom or Sarah? I love it. I mean, good bunny hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The bunny it's hill a is confidence builder. They got a, the fear is based on not being comfortable. What makes them not comfortable? They don't have the skill set to do it. And so work the skill set. We are doing a, this just brings up in my mind, we're doing a clinic called Bunny Hill Burnout this season. This is a clinic <laughs> I've designed. Uh, we've all spent more time than we've wanted on the bunny hill, perhaps, right? <laughs> a lot of times we, we want the child to succeed just so we can escape this weird little prison we've created, right? So making it fun for us and being able to do it forever and engage for us will make that space, okay, maybe this isn't about terrain progression. Maybe this is about some other um, gains we can have right here. Um, so that one is, is a, really, a really powerful tool when you think, okay, why do I wanna move up to this next level? You know, is, is there a high chance I might have someone who's, is this going to cause a lot of fear? Do I see fear in other parts of the skiing? Maybe I need to stay here and figure out how to make it fun. Uh, and hopefully we can get, have some resources and share that information to have endless fun in the bunny hill. I've spent more hours probably by now in 16 years on the bunny hill than off the bunny hill. So it's my fun <laughs> little non-prison non now. Uh, what else are we getting on the, on the comments? Great questions. What if the person saying I can't, I can't is, a, is a, an instructor? Comedy. <laughs> and, and Barbara, that happens. Yeah. <laughs> the cavalry comes in. <laughs> it's like, yeah, away. I mean, if this was easy, everybody would be doing it, people. You know, God bless you. This is not an easy gig. So I'm so glad you just said that because it is true. And what you guys give out of your hearts, I mean, it is a process. And, and just any inch of you moving the momentum forward is a lot. So I, And I mean, here's something else I want to say about that. When I was working with volunteers recently, I had a young woman break into tears. 
their negative behavior or failure to make gains or not liking skiing is not a reflection on you not being good at this. You know, we take so personally, I know I used to get so embarrassed when the child I was supposed to be consulting on, you know, was freaking out in the hallway and I'm supposed to be the one that comes in and, you know, let me, you know, get my magic wand out and make it so. I mean, these kids bring a lot to the page and you're in there giving it your good effort. So I don't let their negative behavior or failure to progress be a reflection on you. You, what would be a reflection on you is that you um, don't seek the help and support you need to do what you need to make this a better experience for both you and the child. Yeah, and, and that question is, is somewhat of a jest. Uh, what if your volunteer is saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, but however, that being a joke, if you're a new volunteer or someone who hasn't worked with uh, people with certain disabilities, that can be uncomfortable for you. And that is one of the beauties of having two volunteers on a lesson um, to kind of lean on each other and take the time to say, it's okay being uncomfortable with this les lesson. It's okay to be patient with myself and learning how to interact with people. Um, so it's okay to, to, to doubt yourself out there and, and, uh, and learn from it. I, I like that question. We don't vibe with kids. You know, nobody wants to say, I don't like that kid. And we're not supposed to say that. And we shouldn't say that out loud. But <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you're repeating it off an awful lot. But, but there are times when you just don't vibe and somebody else might vibe, you know, like, and then, um, you know, I see all the less than ones at my office because the other nurse practitioner likes the greater than 90s. I get nervous with the, the very elderly and she gets nervous with the very little. There are things we're good at. There are people we connect with. It's okay to not be able to do something. Some kids have tremendous um I think you'd have a little girl I worked with for a while. The stubborn streak in some children with Down syndrome is unbelievable. So, and sometimes you just don't have the patience or the kind of personality that can do that kind of thing. Some people like feedback. Uh, so a child who's very lovey-dovey, like most Down syndrome children, um, they like that versus an autistic child who doesn't give you anything back. Their personalities play into how we are and what we do. So if you're not making a good fit, I say, you know, this is recreation and you guys are volunteering. Get a better fit. And just to add on that, even, I mean, if, even with your participant, and we reiterate this in our dry land trainings, we're going to do it online right now, obviously. But if you're paired like your new volunteers with a veteran volunteer and, and kind of like Bill was saying, if that vibe isn't working, come talk to us because that energy is a direct reflection of what's going to happen on your lesson. And it really, it can make or break. I mean, that first couple minutes out of the shoot, not even the first couple minutes, first couple seconds of how you guys are interacting will be the success of your lesson or not. And so it's not, it's, don't take, it's not a personal thing. It's just like, hey, this is not working. And we, and we don't go up and say, hey, you guys suck. Or, you know, you're out. It's like, we'll, we'll figure out a better way to uh, mesh and make things work for your, for our skiers. Um, and uh. Sorry, I was, there's another great question in here. I love it. Shoot. Uh, Callie, nailed it. Do you see some of any of these same behavior patterns sitting down and not wanting to keep skiing with adults? Yes. Yeah, um, my mother. <laughs> Barb, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. But it's a different, and maybe, Barb, you can lean more into this, but um, it's, it's not so much as I sit down and, and pout, they get very frustrated. And a lot of our participants go within themselves again. And then there's a lot of excuses why, why they can't do this or where they should be. And then a lot of time emotion comes out like frustration. I don't know about you, but I know when I get frustrated, I start welling up. It's not because I'm sad. Sometimes I am, or I'm really happy, but the frustration in some of our adults is because there's, there's an expectation, an expectation within themselves to want to succeed. And so, yes, you, I don't know necessarily about sitting so down. Adults, you know, um, people with developmental disabilities grow up and they still have developmental milestones and trajectories that move into adulthood. Mm -hmm. And part of being an adult is the integrity of your performance. So very much adults with disabilities can recognize um, their disabilities and get frustrated. The other thing is habits are longstanding and it is much harder to learn a skill like skiing starting after the teen years than starting before. The flexibility of your brain, the flexibility of your body. I mean, it's a very physiological thing 
So it is harder to learn new skills. You want to learn a language, you should learn it before you're five years old, honestly. Think about what it takes to learn it later, and you just learn it by osmosis as a young child. Motor skills, same kind of thing. I'd never ski now if I tease about my father um, and the ski hill, but I'd never ski now if my father hadn't started me at five, um, you know, because it wouldn't be innate to me. So uh, I'm not athletic like my kids. So I think that these people have kind of been a long time in getting to the place they are and they want to come out and they want to be a part of this and they want to feel success and it's difficult it's a difficult thing so again I break it down into small meaningful units I'd have them feel good about something you don't want to overpraise an adult with a disability um, they get your number they get your number if you tell them they did a great job writing a sentence that's three cent three words long you are going to get a three word long sentence the rest of the day. You need to say nice three words. I think you can do more than that. Same thing on the ski hill. Good with this. Let's move on. Success will breed success. Momentum will build. I think um, Barbara, that's a, a great segue into um, Gus had a great question about the like verbal or inappropriate behavior or, um, on the ski hill. What, yeah. And on that note is that even though you guys are volunteers, our part for the most part our participants know what's right and wrong and that if they're acting inappropriately on the ski hill that is not appropriate period if that if they're doing on the ski hill you know they're not supposed to be doing that outside of the ski hill and this is sort of that manipulation sometimes that comes in and you want to make sure that it's like if, if this is not appropriate you, you you're allowed to lay down the law i think a lot of times we're like, oh, we don't want to be too mean and oh, we want them to like us and oh, we're supposed to have fun. But I mean, sometimes it's like, hey, this is inappropriate and we need to reevaluate what you're doing. And in whatever way you want to say that, you know, either we're going in or there's consequences of your behaviors and, and not to be afraid to do that because it sets the standard of, hey, what am I going to get away with and what am I not in order to keep moving forward? Because generally speaking, some of these behaviors last only a couple seconds and it's a test to see how we're going to react. Exactly what Barbara was saying from the get-go is how think, are we going to yeah. encourage it? The biggest thing, negative behavior, any, I think you guys must have guidelines on what, you know, is going to be outside the box. Um, but if there's negative behavior, the best thing to do is to not let positive behavior follow it. So if, if you get a bad run and a kid is swearing at you, I, and it's a fun recreational activity and you're a volunteer. I say the lesson's over personally. I think we really have to hold, and I feel this way for neurotypical kids, we got to start raising our bar on behavior, how we speak to each other, what's respectable behavior. I, I really feel strongly that kids need to see that from all of us. Hey, and just you guys, I mean, you are role models out there. I mean, yeah. it is amazing the impact that you have on all of our participants from the very get-go and yeah. your actions. I mean, just like what Barbara was saying, I mean, I have a little girl I've been working with for what, 12 or 13 years and she can remember exactly what happened like 10 years ago. And I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, so, you know, you're representing and you're educating and you're encouraging these kids to, um, we're socializing virtually a lot of our participants into a world that they might not otherwise have a chance to get to. So being that positive role model is really important. And, and, and setting those guidelines is, is part of it. I mean, you're not the parent, but you are for that two hours or the four hours or however long you have your participant, that role model for them. There's a, there's a good question from, or a comment from John about some of our specific groups, counterpoint and reach not acceptable. Um, we, a lot of people who have been with us for a long time will know what's not acceptable. Um, and, and if there's questions on that, as far as if you're new to a participant between disciplining and trying to dig deeper to see what a deeper behavior is, you can ask the staff. We, we make ourselves available to debrief and that's a, a huge, huge goal um, for this. Counterpoint and reach, just at a, a program note, counterpoint and reach are not joining us this year because they're still in phase one of lockdown. So their, their, their people haven't done any um, activities in the past couple months. Um, so we will not be having them at Bridgers, unfortunately, but hopefully we see them again soon. A lot, and just to, sorry, and to add on what Patrick's saying, even though Breach and Counterpoint aren't coming, there are some other schools that will be joining us. And another way to um, reiterate that appropriate behavior, if you have, you're skiing with Johnny and Johnny's come up with 10 of his school friends 
and Johnny really wants to ski with Billy um, and he's not acting appropriately, you can also use that other, your, their friends to say, hey, maybe I should go grab Billy and would Billy act like this? Or um, you don't want to get too carried away by comparing, but it's an incentive to say, oh, you know, Billy's on the bunny hill and did we not want to go to the, bill, or the bunny hill? Because if you want to get to the bunny hill, then you're going to have to sort of change your attitude or your behavior in order to move, again, that momentum forward. Yeah, so these are all great. Um, great we're question. reaching the hour mark. If there are any oh. other last questions, um, please put them in there. I just want to kind of wrap this up a little bit. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Barbara, for being here here to go over what we have You're coming welcome, in the future <laughs> why thank you um okay to call her mom mom will be here again next wednesday with more disability thank you. it's just too weird him calling me barbara it's weird for us. mother mother will be here next wednesday 5 30 again our time okay um with a okay. disability I thought awareness we, did we change it to six okay we changed it to six yeah. six p.m our time um and then uh, other related trainings Colleen, who is the new staff member with us at the Bridget program, is an OT, uh, is an OT, and will be doing some digging deeper into the sensory needs of our participants. So that we'll do a whole clinic on that, uh, and then that is that is still to be scheduled. Um, but yeah, the next one we have on is next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Can I tell uh, one quick story, Pat? Of course you may. Regarding sensory input. So Patrick and his buddy in high school. Can I tell this story? I he don't know. know but, I don't know. But <laughs> I got my finger on the mute button, but go okay. ahead. So they had a guy who had this sensory issue with snow and he always wanted to eat the snow and they couldn't get him down the ski hill. So one of these two goons put a snowball on a stick in front of the kid and the other one geared him down to get him down the ski hill. Talking about sensory issues. I thought it was brilliant. Awesome. Yeah, I don't know if that's yeah, probably, probably not really different. acceptable now. Probably, but, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't. I don't bait humans or bears anymore. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, you guys, again, I'm going to just go on C Patrick's coattails for thank you for joining us. It's awesome. We're going to we are trying to focus on more of the panel based um, this virtual sort of input. So again, what Barbara was saying, if you have questions or something that you didn't get out right now and think of something, um, thank you for offering your email. You can shoot Patrick or myself an email um, because these are discussions and what we covered today are real life uh, scenarios and situations and, and behaviors that we do deal with every single day. Every, I mean, when we're on the ski hill and outside of the ski hill as well. But um, so if you can keep joining us, this is great, Barbara. I'm so, I'm so excited to see you next week. Thanks. And all your smiling faces. If anybody has specific questions, I mean, to talk about de developmental disabilities in an hour is going to be tough. So if if there are specific um, uh, questions people have about given disabilities with clients that they've been working with or whatever, shoot them my way and we'll problem solve it. Cool. So the time next week is my time, eight o'clock, correct? So six o'clock right. our yes, time. Yes, please. Uh, and then I'm just typing in my contact info into the chat box if anyone wants to have further questions if you don't have it already. That's my work cell and my work email. Um, so that's coming out. But otherwise, thank you so much for being here. It was Great such a treat to see all. some faces. Enjoy. Thanks for doing this. And it's I'll, really le it's I'll really leave the great. chat up for a minute. But uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Night. Thanks again, Barbara. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Bye, Pat. Bye, Ma. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Love it. Oh, and look my, at all the people still on. They're the my, contact, my contact is in there, up there, if anyone needs it. I'm just I love hanging it. out. I love these discussions. I love everyone. People don't want to get off the... <laughs> <laughs> the webinars don't you just want to sit and talk to everybody i do i know it's a weird it's a weird uh format but i don't know if we've had 75 people come to a, a dry land in the eagle mount base not well some, not, not in a while 75 today ways, and 100 and something yesterday so nice nice job gang it's great to to just engage as, 
a bunch of people. This is awesome. There's Lisa still hanging in there. Jody, DeVoe, Bill, you, Dave Shrupp. You, you can have my mom, DeVoe. Hank. I, I love her, but I need a break, I tell you. <laughs> At least we have a nephew in the family now, so it takes a lot of her energy. As a developmental specialist, you can think, you can guess that that drives my sister insane, raising a, raising her child. <laughs> yeah, but it looks like she's having so much fun. They and, have a full You know on. what? On next Wednesday, you got to put the, your nephew's picture up because everyone's going to like spitting image. I should. I should. Bill uh, Wanders, how are you? Let's let's unmute some people here. Yeah. Let's see if I can talk to us. Them. Talk to us, Jody House. Talk on. to us, Phil. Hold on. Phil I can, and I can Betsy, see you guys. Phil hey. and Betsy swilling wine, making us jealous. Nice. I just switched the permission so people can unmute themselves if anyone <laughs> wants to and, and chime in. <laughs> that, that was my first question is, I don't know what the norms are of Zoom. Is it okay to eat or not while you're in a Zoom meeting? I think for this posse, it's a go. And, All good. and apparently the McFlukes have no problem imbibing and swilling wine. So <laughs> <laughs> Not the only one. Yeah. I, I, I saw John Schmidt down there slugging his beers. I was told I was told once that this is not a dry campus by any means. <laughs> when I was when I was about to play my guitar. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should be the intro and the exit with that guitar. Yeah. Eagle Mount has yeah, a okay. on beer now. That would be awesome. Good I was point. To yeah. last night. I was trying to show hey, you. Hey, that was amazing. By the way, I just want to say that was amazing. I learned so much, and I can't wait to get the recording of it so I can listen to the whole thing again and take notes. Great. Awesome. You, you bring up a good point. We have. I wasn't. How did we get the recording? That's a great question. Yeah. It um, said it was being recorded. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're hiding. The recordings are hiding in the cloud right now. <laughs> okay. And we're starting this LMS, which is an online learning system. So I'm going to put the links to those in there. Uh, as soon as that's up, which should be the next handful of days. So when you start engaging the learning system, there's going to be a section that has all of the webinars we've run um, for the different topics. And you can just click on the link and watch it um, like you want. And we, yeah, I, that was just I forget amazing. To keep I thought people. that was just absolutely, yeah, over the top. Great. Great job, you guys. Yeah, Pat, your mom's fabulous. Isn't I'm a lucky she guy. Awesome. I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> Ray, I wonder where you got that energy, Patrick. Yeah. It's uh, awesome. Yeah, Brian. And thank you, Brian. For So if people don't know this, Brian played music. And we did these fire pit nights at this summer at Eagle Mount campus. We have six fire pits. So that allowed six different families to sign up and stay separated from, from the other groups. And we taught fire building and uh, some more. played some played some camp games and then brian did sing-alongs and it was a riot so just throwing out a, a plug to the summer program great fun <laughs> <laughs> and yeah that it was, was great I the loved it. people ate brian up they loved it <laughs> thank you for the opportunity <laughs> well you're not off the hook brian so bring your guitar I know. No, I love it. <laughs> Let's yeah, I can't wait to talk to you about some um, other fundraising opportunities I have too. So nice, yeah. Nice. Well, I I gotta go ahead, Betsy. We're gonna leave and uh, have dinner. Now that okay. great. great to see everybody. You know what? I think next week we'll encourage everyone to stay on and unmute and just hear the pandemonium. I would love it. <laughs> and I yeah. might even send a little email says everybody grab their favorite drink. I mean, it doesn't even have to be uh, uh, alcohol. But, and let's have a toast at the end of this. Let's make this fun. Good idea. Cheers. Nice. Love it. All right. Uh -huh. <laughs> Bye, right. everybody. Bye, guys. Bye, so great guys. to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Toodaloo. Thank you, guys. So fun. Patrick's still on here?